I am so glad you're here. I'm excited. Uh, Gene and I were just talking about it. He said this morning he woke up. Before he could even go to work, he was so excited about coming and having a revival. So let's have a revival. Um, you know, there was a song that we used to sing a long time ago, and I don't think we're probably going to do it this week, but it's, it's going about. Let others see Jesus in me. Don't you think that's what revival is all about? Yes. So uh, what we're going to do, I want everybody to know, I'm sure most of you already do, but y'all know Boy Mora? Oh, yeah. Okay. And even what I think almost everybody knows, the rest of our praise team. So I am so excited. God is going to move through us. I know everybody already knows Jim. We're going to put self-introduce here in a little while. But I want us to stop right now. And I want us to just join together. Just lift up our hearts. Just close your mind to anything else in the whole wide world. And let's just talk to God. Just for a minute. Father God, we talk to you in the name of Jesus our Christ. Father God, we talk to you tonight. Asking you to take over. Take total and complete control of this building. Of every heart. Everything to do with you. Father, as we are gathered here today, asking you to revive our hearts. And then let that revival be so strong that it just spreads throughout and we can't stop it. Father, we don't want to stop it. We want you, <coughs> your name to be glorified, your name to be honored. And everyone that does not know you to come to a saving knowledge of you. Because you are our salvation, our hope, our strength. And you are our future. <coughs> Father, we offer you this night, praising you now, already, for the things you're going to do. I lift up uh, Wade and the praise team as they lead us in, in a worshipful experience, bringing us to a time listening for your word. I pray for Jim this morning. Mm -hmm. Father, you know what needs to be said. Help us that we would hear it. And it's in the name of Jesus our Christ again that we pray. Amen. Yeah. Well, let's uh, stand. Yeah. Let's sing. He is making me glad. Oh, <laughs> 
Thank <laughs> you. 
Father, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would permeate this place and uh, that you might use your messenger to speak to our hearts. So we pray that you give him unction, fill him with your Holy Spirit. And may there be a demonstration of your Spirit. In the services tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When I wake up in the morning, put my feet on the floor, thank him for the day he gave me one more. I give him all the praise, one that I adore. That's Jesus, oh, that's Jesus. I was lost and all alone. Heart in need of hell, I found eternal life, lost my fear of death, cause I know the author of my every breath, that's Jesus, oh that's Jesus, God of glory, majesty, the Holy One. a soul that's lost and need a direction wonder when you die if you'd go to heaven friend I found the answer to that very question that's Jesus oh that's Jesus God of glory Gene before services began, he, he asked me a question, an honest question. He said, are you nervous? And at the time I said, no, I'm not really. I'm a little anxious, but I'm not nervous. And then about halfway through the song service, it suddenly dawned on me. <laughs> there are at least six preachers sitting in this congregation at this very time. <laughs> and every one of them is a better preacher than I ever thought about being. But they're going to have to suffer along with the rest of us. <laughs> if you have your Bibles with you, would you take and turn with us to the book of Luke, the first chapter? I think many of you, as you look at Luke, the first chapter, you, you kind of question, you kind of have something come to your mind, but that's the story of the announcement of the birth of Jesus. 
That's the Christmas story. Well, we're really, really not going to preach about Christmas tonight. But there's a very wonderful portion of that scripture that we want to share in just a moment. We look at that and we look at the background and we see, first of all, an angel, the angel Gabriel had come to Elizabeth and spoke to Elizabeth and said, you're going to have a son and you're going to call his name John. Now Elizabeth looked at him and we see one other account recorded in the Bible concerning a situation much like this. A lady by the name of Sarah. Now the angel came to Sarah and said, Sarah, you're going to have a son. And she looked at him and she laughed. She said, I'm 90 years old. You know, I know what she was thinking about. She said, I'm 90 years old and I'm past the time of fooling around. <laughs> But we think of this, and we rejoice in this, and sure enough, she gave forth and gave birth to a son. And now the angel Gabriel has come to Elizabeth and announced to her, Elizabeth, you and, and your husband, you're going to have a son, and you're going to name him John, and he is going to be the forerunner of a man by the name of Jesus. We look a little bit later in that chapter, and Gabriel once again comes. And now he comes to a very young lady. A young lady by the name of Mary. And he, Gabriel announces to her, Mary, you're going to have a son, and he is going to be the Savior of the world. He is going to be the Emmanuel that has been so promised, and you're going to name him Jesus. Amen. And even while you sit here, you're cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant. She's, a, she, she's already conceived and she's about to give birth. But Mary began to kind of hesitate. And she simply said, how, how can this be? I, I, I've never known man. I, I, I've never been with a man. How can this be? And with that, Gabriel uses this passage Luke 1, 37, and he uses this verse that I kind of want us to think about for our text tonight. And it simply says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. Amen. You know, the remarkable thing as I think of this is that the simplicity of the Word of God it is so simple that a child can understand it and can accept it and can accept Christ as their Savior, but it's so complex that it baffles scholars for years and years and years. But the simplicity of the Word was just simply that. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Now, we're going to be a little... A, a little interactive with our message tonight. How many of you really believe that with nothing, God is impossible? Amen. For truly, whatever God decides He wants to do, He can do. Amen. Now, sometimes we have to, uh, in our little mind, we have to make it a little harder than it really is. And we like to use a lot of churchy words. We like to use word, a lot words like... Because God is, is uh, nothing is impossible with God, we like to use words like, God is omnipotent. <laughs> For a dollar, you can use that word. <laughs> God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Yes. That's basically what it means. He has the power to do whatever it is that He wants to do. And we have only to go to the Old Testament and to see and to encounter a number of occasions where the power and the majesty and the glory of God shone through to the people. Amen. Remember Moses as they got ready to leave the uh, got ready to leave Egypt, and they had finally reached that point, and they were finally on their way, and they came to the Red Sea, and as they got to that point, somebody said. Uh-oh. 
You know, I'm reminded so much of the little boy who came home from Sunday school. And Mama and Daddy were sitting at the dinner table and they said to him, Son, what did you learn at Sunday school? And he paused and he hesitated for quite some time. And finally he said, Well, we learned about Moses. And what did you learn about Moses? And he hesitated for quite some time. And finally he said, Well, what we learned was that Moses was leading the people and he got in a bind. And so he got on his radio and he called the Corps of Engineers and they came and they built a pontoon boat to get a, a, a bridge across that great lake and they walked across. And then they called the, de the demolition team and they blew it up. <laughs> and mom and dad looked at him and they said, is that really what you learned? And the little boy looked at him and said, No, but if I told you what they told me, you sure wouldn't believe that. <laughs> but we looked at the majesty and the power of God. And when the time came, He parted the sea. And that great host of people went across. Amen. And along came the Egyptian army. And just as they had begun, as they were entered into the, to the dry lake bed, the Wings of, uh, of the great sea came and they collapsed and the entire army and everything there, they were drowned. It was the power and the majesty and the might of an almighty God. We see as they travel a bit longer, Moses is no longer with them and Joshua has taken command of the people and they enter into the land. And the first place they come to is a city by the name of Jericho. And God gives them some very explicit instructions as to how they were to perform. And He said to them, here's what I want you to do. I want you every day, for six days, I want you to walk around the city marching. But on the seventh day, I want you to march around that city I want you to march around that city seven times and when you go through, when you go around the seventh time, I want you to shout with all of your might. And when they did, the walls of that great city, that impenetrable city, fell and they had a great victory because of the almighty power of God. He's omnipotent. We look and we see how God moves into the lives of people. But not only is God omnipotent, God is omnipresent. Now that basically means He's everywhere. There are at least two of you that are old enough to remember a comedian singer by the name of Ray Stevens. Now, Ray Stevens had such world classic songs as Ahab the Arab. <laughs> he had such wonderful songs as, as, as the song about the squirrel that went to church. <laughs> and such tremendously fine, wonderful gospel songs uh, about, uh, as, such as the, uh, the, the Shriners Convention. But one of his, one of my favorite of his, was simply a song called, they call him The Streak. <laughs> you remember the song? You remember yes. going back a few hundred years ago, the custom and the habits of the people, and we won't even get into it because we have some young people, we don't even put ideas in mind. <laughs> But we had a habit and a custom and, a, and a, an abomination of where they, for whatever reason, they would run through and they'd forget to get dressed. <laughs> and they call them the streak. But the thing, the line that always amazed me was this. Ray Stevens used to shout at the top of his, at the top of his voice, He's everywhere! He's everywhere! <laughs> well, I think of God. He's everywhere. Amen. I look and I think in the, in the events and the lives of David. 
I, excuse me, in the, in the lives of Daniel. And Daniel was a mighty man of God. A man who worshipped God, who loved God, who, who believed everything that God said. And he refused to bow before any false idols. And when the chips were down, he stood his ground. But he was thrown into the lion's den. And he was remained there overnight. Oh, I, I really love the portion of the scripture that comes next. Because the next morning, while it was still dark, the king, who recognized and realized the fallacy of what he had done, went running to the lion's den and cried out, Daniel, was your God able to deliver? And the voice of Daniel cried out, My God has sent an angel and... I am unharmed. Listen, there's not many cases that we find recorded in the Bible that tells us about Daniel and the lion with the lockjaw. <laughs> but he could not eat him. And then we look at three young men by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they too stood strong for the Lord. And when they came and, and they came to the point and place in their life where they had to take a stand for God, they were willing to do it and they stood firm. Yes, they did. Amen. And they were thrown into a fiery furnace. And the Bible says that if the fire was so hot that it consumed those who threw them in. Oh, and I, I remember the words next. For it simply says that they, as they were walking about in the fire, that the king said, did we not throw three men in the fire? And is there not a fourth? And does he not look like the Son of God? He's everywhere. God is everywhere. How many of you believe that God is omnipresent? Yes. Amen. Amen. God is omnipotent. Now that's a word that simply means God knows everything. How many of you believe that God knows everything? I want you to know you've just been set up. <laughs> because I want to announce my sermon topic at this point. And that's simply this. Three things God doesn't know. Three things God doesn't know. Well, you know, sometimes it's not so bad to be fooled. Because I look and I recognize, I see, I see what, it, what we're talking about. The first thing that God does not know is that God does not know a sin He does not hate. God does not know a sin He does not hate. We like to minimize our sins. I, I tell our Sunday school class on far too frequently, I'm sure. There's only two snakes that you have to be afraid of. A big one and a little one. And there are no middle-sized ones. There are only two sins that you have to be afraid of. A big one and a little one. And there are no medium-sized. Oh, but how we try to minimize. How we try to speak of, uh, of the sins and how we look at the sins of others and how we, we always seem to figure out that everybody else's sins are just a little bit worse than mine. How we always try to figure out that, well, what somebody else does, well, you know, that's, that's not quite as... That, that's a little worse than what I did. When God dealt with the people in the wilderness... He gave to Moses and He gave to the people a list of ten rules. We simply call them the Ten Commandments. Pastor John often refers to them as the Ten Suggestions. And sometimes that's exactly what they have become. Ten simple rules to live by. But I remember Jesus as He was upon the face of the earth that a, 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 great, a great man, a, a wise man of the temple, 
A man who had every intention of, uh, of uh, or every self-concept of being wiser than everybody else came to Jesus not for the intent of learning, but for the intent of entrapping him. And he said to him, Good master, oh, don't you love the piety of those people? Good master, what's the greatest of the commandments? He could have cared less. But Jesus fooled him. He said, the greatest of the commandments is this. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all the mind, with all the soul. And the second is likened to the first. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, many of us would say, but that's not the Ten Commandments. Yes, it is. You see, the first four of the Ten Commandments deal with our, our vertical relationship between us and God. The first four simply talk about our relationship with God. And what Jesus said, the greatest of the commandments is we ought to have a relationship with God. And the second, of the, the, the next six, deal with our relationship with our fellow man. And Jesus said, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That you should do those things that God would have for you to do. And the, these would all, all would fulfill the need. Man in his infin infinite wisdom has managed to take it and take the Ten Commandments that God has given us, take the two that Jesus has summarized, and we've managed to turn it into one. And that's simply, if it feels good, do it. We have become a, a, a nation of depravity. God does not know a sin that He does not hate. Look in, in the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 19 and following, it simply says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, deschivousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, various emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Paul, in writing the to the church at Galatia, said these things God hates, and he went on. And you know what he did? He simply called the road of that church membership. Oh, yeah. Brother Sam, you've got this one. And, and Brother Joe, this is yours. And Sister Susie, this is the sin that you are so much a part of. And he called the role of the sins. God does not know a sin. He does not hate. But you know the remarkable thing Paul goes on right in the next uh, a couple of verses beneath that. But look what he says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Long-suffering, gentle, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. God never gave us an opportunity to experience and to know sin that He did not give us the opportunity to escape that same sin. God never knew a sin He did not hate. God never knew a sinner He did not love. Oh my. You know, I, I have to be very honest with you. I've met some pretty salty characters in my day. I really have. And in anybody's world, I would just simply tell you, I've met some pretty mean dudes. But I have never met one that God could not love. We look at that. Look at the lengths which God would go to to reach out and to touch the lives of those that He loved. One of the most remarkable stories and one that, that, that I have loved all of my life since childhood because it epitomizes my whole life. And that's the story of a man by the name of Jonah. Now Jonah 
might be everyone's story. For God called to Jonah and said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, that wicked city, and I want you to proclaim, and I want you to preach the word. I want you to go and tell the people what God has done. And Jonah did exactly what most of us do in our lifetime at one time or another. He said, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'd just be happy to do it. And he ran the other direction. As hard and as fast as he could. But when God wants something done, it's going to get done. Now, I will tell you, he used Jonah. But if your obstinance and your stubbornness is such, He will remove that call from you and give it to somebody else, but His message and His will will be carried out. Oh, but the price that you may pay because of your obstinance and your stubbornness and your unwillingness to do what God wants you to do. But Jonah got on a board ship. You know the story. You know what happened to him. And old Jonah got on board the ship and he went over there and he laid down and he went to sleep. And pretty soon they were caught up in a ferocious storm. And before long, that, uh, the, the Bible simply says that they threw everything overboard. Everything, all the freight, the fear of, uh, of losing your ship was abundant. And finally they said, who has offended their God? And you know, I have to hand it to Jonah. Jonah raised his hand and said, it was me. You throw me overboard, it'll all be okay. Folks, have you ever been thrown overboard in these storms of life? Have you ever gone tumultuously into the seas of life wondering what would happen and how it would all happen and how it would all come about only to see God's wonderful deliverance. And so it was. And Jonah, it just, it did amazing how people think. The Bible says that Jonah was, swall uh, was swallowed up by a great fish. Matthew 12, 40 says, And even as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. This great whale scarfed him up. And scholars tell us a whale can't do that. They don't have the proper gullet. You fail to look at something. The Bible says, and God created a special fish. <laughs> Jonah's fish. That's what it says. Go look at Jonah 2 and read it. And God created a fish. And he swallowed him up. And he was three days and three nights in the darkness, in the bitterness of a whale, in the belly of a whale. Folks, I don't know what it was like. I don't think it was real pleasant. <laughs> but somehow, God must have spoke to Jonah. I don't know exactly what he said, but somehow it came about and God said, Jonah, do I have your attention yet? <laughs> Most assuredly, Lord. <clears throat> and the Bible proclaims and says, and the whale, the whale vomited him up. An out of tune Christian in a lost and dying world is a stomachache to those who were lost and dying. And Jonah went. And he walked the streets of Nineveh and he proclaimed the word and he proclaimed it up and down, proclaiming God's mercies. And sure enough, 
a great revival took place in that city. And many came to know God. And Jonah, Jonah did what a lot of Christians do. But I knew he would do that. I knew God would do that. I, didn't want, I don't like those people. God didn't say I had you. He had to like them. All he had to do was go preach to them. Because God never met a sinner he didn't love. He called a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. Now Saul was on a mission. He was on a mission to kill as many of those Christians as he could. Wherever they were hiding, whatever hole they were in, he was going to pull them out. But one day on the road to Damascus, he had an experience with God and God saved him and redeemed him and turned him around. And made him a new creature. And Paul became the greatest missionary of all time. The greatest preacher of all time. I heard Paul described this way. And I hope not to offend anyone. And I don't know that this is what Paul looked like. But the description was something like this. Paul was very short. Very fat. And very bald headed. And he wasn't even a good preacher. <laughs> There's hope for all of us, isn't there? <laughs> because when God anoints you and calls you, God equips you for the task that He's given to you. And Paul went. Paul goes with us. Paul leads us. Look at the places that God has gone. We look and we, we, we look at Daniel and the lions again. We look at we look at the experiences of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. David, the psalmist, in a much quieter, a much more serene passage, simply talked about this when he simply said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. So even in times of great despondency and great discouragement, even in times when we are frail and we are failing, God is with us. God will go to any depth. God will go to any place. I've had my moments. I've, in my own lifetime, faced death four times face to face. I've known what it was like, literally, to see what it could be like. I was driving an explosive truck and it turned over. Nothing happened other than I lost a boot and the police searched for it all day the next day and it was nowhere to be found. I was on a drilling rig and I had the bales of the drilling rig some 90 something feet up in the air and the guy got upset with the man on the, on the ground floor and so he threw the brake on and he knocked me unconscious and I was hanging up there. And they brought me down. I faced death. But never, ever have I been where God wasn't with me. And so it is when we look at this, God never loved us, never had a person, a sinner that He did not love. And I do not know your situation and your purpose in life. But if you're here today and you have never, ever, ever come to the point and place of life where you have asked Christ to come into your life, I need to express to you, 
from the depths of my heart, you have a God who loves you. You have a God who wants to be a part of your life. You have somebody who cares. The beautiful song, words of the song said, No boy never cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend I know like him. No one else can take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. That's the kind of Savior that we have. But there's one last thing that God does not know. God does not know a person He cannot save. Oh, I'm too mean. I've done too many things. I've done too many evil things. I, I, I've done too many things that are unforgivable. I, I've done too many things in my life that, that, that just cannot, God cannot forgive. No matter to what depth you have reached, you have never reached beyond the reach of a loving, almighty God. God loves you. One of the greatest experiences of my ministry, and I honestly didn't realize it until the last few years, was when I met a man by the name of, of Winterford Griffin. He worked in the oil field in southeastern New Mexico. And any of you that know the old time Drillers of that day and time, they were some of the meanest, crudest folks you ever met. And that was wonderful. He was as lost a man as there could ever be. He was as angry a man as there ever was. He was as cruel a man as ever existed. One day, his daughter who attended our church came to me and she begged me to go. And I had never met him, but she was a young lady and she begged me to go and visit him. He had, within the last week or two, had been diagnosed and been told he had cancer. And she said, would you go and at least talk to him? And so I did. I walked into that home. I introduced myself. And I won't tell you his exact words. But basically, his words were pretty much something along these lines. You've got about 10 seconds to get out of this door. Get out that door, or I'll throw you out. And that's pretty much the... That's the cleaned up version of what he said. That's all I did. But his daughter begged me to go back. And over time, I, I would go back once in a while and we'd just sit down and I wouldn't talk to him about anything. But we'd just sit and drink coffee a little bit. And he could tolerate me. But one day, his daughter called me on the phone and she said, you've got to come. You've got to come right now. Well, I supposed that it was the end and he was nearing the very passing of time. And I walked, I got to the home and I walked in and there, sitting in a, in a recliner where he stayed 24-7 was a man who was just crying his eyes out. And I said to him, Winifred, what can I do for you? And he said, I'm lost and I'm going to hell and nobody can do anything about it.
I sit down beside him. I actually sit down on the floor beside him and we talked. And I just simply told him the truth. Winifred, I can't do one thing for you. But Jesus can. Jesus can. And he was somewhat of an uneducated man, and I, I didn't know any other better way. I didn't have any good sense. Still don't. But I just simply shared the simplest form of the, of the plan of salvation I know. The ABCs of salvation. You know, admit you're lost. Believe that Jesus can save you. Confess your sin. Doesn't take a brain surgeon to do it. And I shared with him. Right there in his home, he accepted Christ. The meanest man I believe I had ever met in my life was now my brother. Well, I just have to just share the end of that story. He called me two or three days later and he said, I, I, I'm doing pretty good. Can you come by at your convenience? And so I went by and he said, but Jim, I, I need to be baptized. And I said, well, Winifred, we, we, we'll do what we can do. We'll figure out a way. He said, no, no, you don't understand. I want to go to church and be baptized. <clears throat> well, two weeks later, he walked into church, his wife on one side, his daughter on the other, just holding him up. When the invitation was given, and I, I knew in advance he was coming, and when the invitation was given, they helped him to the front. And I introduced him and told the congregation who he was and what was going on. And I said, normally, you know, somebody comes forward, we baptize them the following week. And I said, we're going to baptize Winifred right now. And we did. And we did. The Lord granted him some respite. He became better for a few months and actually was able to come to church a few times before he passed away. But I got to tell you about the man I knew before, the man I knew after. Because the man that I came after he accepted Christ, this new man had to learn a new vocabulary. His old words wouldn't take it. He had to learn a, a new walk because he served a new master. I'll never forget walking into his home and he stuck an envelope and he said, I, I need, to, need you to take care of this for me. And I said, what is it? He said, it's my tithe. I said, Winifred, I bless you, but you know, you got no money. And he said, oh, but if I don't give it to the Lord, I stole from the Lord, and I'm not a thief anymore. I used to be, but I'm not a thief anymore. I never met a man so bad that God couldn't save him. I look at our congregation tonight. I don't see those kind of people. But I do see something that bothers me and breaks my heart. Is that sometimes in the ignorance of our life and the, just the lack of knowledge of our life, we have such a misunderstanding. Our relationship with Jesus is a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. 
Far too many people in this world, far too many people believe that I don't need Jesus 101. My mother was a Christian. My daddy was a Christian. My family is a member of the church. Other people I know, my wife's a great Christian. So that's all I need. That's not going to cut it. You've got to reach the point in place in your life where you simply pray the sinner's prayer. Lord, I'm a sinner. I have done many things in life that are not right. I confess those sins today. And I ask you to forgive me of those sins. I've never known a person God would not save if you didn't utter that, if you just utter that prayer. I just want to close with, the, with, with this. The very simplicity of the gospel, the very heart of the gospel, and that's this. We have a sinless Savior who has taken our sins upon Him so that we might have God's righteousness and forgiveness. Gospel in a nutshell. As simple as I know how to put it. As truthful as I know how to express it. There it is. What would you do with Jesus today? My invitation tonight is threefold. There are those that are here that have never ever accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, Lord of their life. And if you're in that situation, you don't have to be the meanest guy in town. You don't have to prove that you're the meanest person in town. All you have to do is be a person in need of Christ to come and accept His forgiveness. If there be one person here, one soul here that has never accepted, never prayed personally, one-on-one, -on -one, the sinner's prayer, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I invite you to come. In a few moments, I'm going to have our pastor standing here. I'm going to just tell you right now, I love our pastor to death, but he cannot save you. But he can introduce you to a Jesus who can. Amen. But there's a second thing. There are people here that have come. Some of you came expecting a circus sideshow. And all you saw was the clown. <laughs> but if you're sincere and honest and earnest and you want to have revival, your prayer should be this. Lord, send a revival and let it begin in me. Lord, I'm not what I ought to be. But I want to be. Help me, Lord, to be what you want me to be. Lord, if I am keeping revival from happening in this church, Remove me and let revival come. If you're here today and you just need to come to the altar and just pray for revival in your life and in this church, we invite you to come. But if you're here today and you've, you've done that, I know that we've been praying for revival for several weeks now. And you just simply want to come and continue the prayer of God's blessings upon this church and God's desire for this church. You want to come and humble yourselves before God. I, I advise you to come. However, whatever that God is wanting to do in your life, we invite you to come. As every head is bowed, every eye is closed, and as our musicians come, may we pray. Father God, as we come to you right now, we simply, humbly,
bow ourselves in reverence to you. And we pray, dear Father, that whatever it is that you have in store for this congregation, that you would throw open the floodgates of blessings right now. Father God, whatever it is that you want from each individual, if there be one person here that has never said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Humble that heart and let them come to Jesus. If there are those who need to come and pray for cleansing of their heart, even now there's, there's a burden and there's, there's something upon their heart they need to make right with thee, I pray, God, that you'd open them up. Lord, if there are those who are spiritually strong today and they, they just want to have your will done, God, move within them. Lord, it's your time. It's your invitation. Take it and use it to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. As we stand together, Brother John A., would you come please? And as we sing together, whatever God deals with you and however God deals with you, won't you come right now?